All right, well, thank you for joining us today. My name is Adolfo Romero, and today I'm here with my colleagues. Gabrielle Hurd. And Ronan Hart. And today is May 26, 2023, and I'm here on behalf of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program at the University of Florida. And this interview that we are conducting today is part of the Challenging Racism at UF's uh, public program series, and, uh, and we're just building off that. So today, uh, who do I have the pleasure to be here with? Hi, um, I'm Adrian Martinez. Well, Adrian, thank you so much for making time. It's a great honor to have you on board here uh, today. So I wanted to begin with you uh, today to discuss a little bit about your uh, experiences that you have. You were a student as an undergrad, and currently you're a student for the um, College of Law. Yes, I was, and I am. And you are. Can you tell me a little bit about those ex about your experiences as an undergrad, and what was your work that you were? What was your thesis on, and what provoked you, or to discuss issues about what you discuss in your thesis? Yeah. So uh, I went to undergrad here. Um, 2016, 2020, took a gap year and ended up going to law school. Um, during undergrad, I majored in history and political science, and I wrote a thesis in history, which is called Divesting Injustice, Reconciling with Slavery and Its Legacies on College Campuses. And in that thesis, I essentially assessed how students were the driving force behind universities confronting their ties to slavery, convict leasing, and mass incarceration. Um, I originally became really interested in education and racial um, justice through taking a Black Lives Matter class uh, my sophomore year of undergrad. That was under uh, Dr. Lauren Perlman. And during that semester, that's when Richard Spencer actually came to speak at UF. Um, so that just further uh, ignited my passion for social justice. and. In that semester and in that class, we had to do a final project. Um, my final project dealt with uh, the disenfranchisement of formerly incarcerated individuals and how we can help um, returning citizens get their right to vote back. And with that project, I had to create a podcast and I had to, um, I was able to work with people from SPOP and the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. So that's what introduced me to SPOP and all the great work there. And from then I got an internship with SPOP and I've just kind of been on this whole little path of uh, social justice. So that's kind of what inspired my thesis and doing work related in that field. Um, more on my thesis, I researched UF, uh, Harvard, Georgetown, and Clemson, and looked at their respective ties to slavery, uh, convict leasing, and prison labor. Um, I'm kind of going on a tangent, so no, feel free right. to like recenter me. Also, I don't really know where to look. No, I <laughs> think no, you're fine. Um, can you think, can you explain a little bit about what you learned from US perspective, UF's perspective, and how did that impact the current work that you're currently doing about the yeah the issues? And can you name some of those issues that that you learned throughout your thesis? UF's perspective. Okay, so when I was researching UF, um, I had came across this 2019. Uh, history undergraduate report. And that report was under Professor John Sensbach, and he took on four undergraduate students, and they all essentially took an independent study and explored UF's connections to slavery. Um, and that was through the East Florida Seminary, which was our predecessor institution, uh, founded in 1853 in Ocala. So those four students researched UF's ties to slavery. They found a lot of financial ties. Um, our board of trustees owned uh, enslaved people. Um, a lot of the students that went to the East Florida Seminary came from slaveholding families or they owned um, enslaved people as well. Um, so that's kind of where I learned about UF's connections to slavery. And then I had learned about UF's connections to prison labor and mass incarceration through a student organization called Divest UF. Um, and they essentially were a student group pushing for UF to cut contracts with the Florida Department of Corrections um, because IFAS uh, used prison labor in their uh, off-center or off-campus facilities. So that's kind of how I got to learn more about UF's connections to slavery and prison labor. And it made me think of, you know, 
how common is this? A lot of institutions were founded, you know, 1800s, even earlier than that. So then that took me down the path to researching more about Harvard, Georgetown, and Clemson. And it's a pretty common theme for, you know, that it's the norm for institutions that were founded during that time. Um, so that's how I came to learn more about UF's connections to racial justice. And I remember with that, I was really impressed to learn about this research. Uh, it came in 2019, and as I was writing my thesis spring of 2020, while I was very impressed by that research, I was also disappointed to learn that you know, that undergraduate publication in 2019, that didn't result in any administrative acknowledgement. It didn't result in any administrative action. And those four students and Dr. John Sensbach, they actually did a town hall type of meeting uh, in 2019 or 2020 with SPOP. And it still, there was no administrative action with that. Um, so with that in mind, I reached out to the report's authors and we drafted a student government resolution. Um, because I remember when I was writing my thesis, I was like, I can't just talk about all these student activists and write about them and then just do nothing. So we were very much inspired by students at Georgetown who had done like a referendum on their part. So we brought, um, and we took that idea and we decided to draft a resolution here at UF. And that resolution essentially requested UF administrators to assemble a working group on indigenous expropriation and slavery to further study our ties to, to connections to racial injustice. Um, so that was spring of 2020. That resolution, we introduced it to the Judiciary Committee, we had about 40 sponsors, um, including the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program and a bunch of professors and student government senators. Um, that resolution was tabled twice and ultimately failed in the Judiciary Committee. Um, and I remember the other authors and I were like, no, like we're not gonna stop here. Like this is way too important to, to just let this fail. Um, well, essentially it got tabled a third time, but when something's tabled a third time, it's, it's failed. So we forced it to a vote from the full floor. Like we brought it to the full Senate at their next like full body meeting and it passed unanimously in the full Senate. And we're just like, I know some of you guys here tabled it again. So why are we, why are you voting for it now? Um, so it was, a little, it was a little funny in that sense, but I will say a lot of the success of that resolution had to do with the timing of it. Um, because it passed unanimously, I wanna say June 2nd of 2020. And that was in the same time as all the George Floyd protests were happening and this whole resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement. So I think it was just the perfect storm for this resolution to have passed. Um, if it were any other semester or any other month, I feel like you know maybe it wouldn't have gotten that much success. Um, but yeah, that passed unanimously, June 2nd, 2020. And then on June 18th, that's when President Fox came out with his uh, statement, another step of against or another step of positive change against racism or something like that. And in that statement, he said, "We're going to create a task force on UF history. We're going to create a task force on honorary namings. Um, we're going to cut ties with the Florida Department of Corrections or something like ending prison labor." Um, but that's when that statement came out. And I remember the other student authors and I were like, wow, I think, I think our student government resolution, like I think it did something. Um, but yeah, so that happened in June. Uh, his statement came out in June. And in October, I got a phone call from President Fox and he asked me to be a part of the task force. Um, so excited for it. And I had the honor of being part of that task force from October of 2020 until our report came out um, last spring in 2022. So for about two years, uh, some other professors, scholars, and I were doing some more research on UF's connections to slavery and indigenous removal. Um, 
so yeah, that was, that was a lot. But <laughs> like that's kind of just been my journey from my thesis to the task force and yeah. All right. Um, okay, so uh, let's focus a little bit on the task force report. Uh, what was the important, why is the task force report important and what were the outcomes of uh, the task force report? What, were, what was it meant to do and was it effective? So our charge was to document the history of the University of Florida um, relationship to race and in particularly uh, Native Americans and African Americans. So that was our charge, just to, to document UF's racial history. Um, with the, the task force being active for two years, there was about 10 of us on it. Um, we all worked on different aspects of UF's history, and we came out with a report that's, I wanna say approximately 100 pages, that details UF's connections to not just slavery and indigenous removal, but also um, UF's connections to convict leasing and uh, segregation, eugenics, racial violence, things like that. Um, I was very, very happy with the report that did come out from us. Um, the other uh, professors and scholars and I on that task force, we really wanted to make a product that went beyond performative me measures. We wanted to make a product that UF could use, like whether it's administrators or other professors, like that they could use in their classrooms. So our report has, while it is a lot of substantial information, a lot of text, there are a lot of charts on it as well. And in the index, I believe, like you can just find a a whole timeline that lists out everything. Um, so I was really happy with the product that we came out with as a task force. Um, and I hope that we can continue to share that report. Um, one of my goals for this report and all the other people on the task force is we don't want this report to just sit on a shelf. Like, you know, there was a lot of research that went into it and we don't want this to be something that just lays around for years that no one's gonna pick up. Um, so our goal with it is we wanted to move beyond performative measures. We wanted to make sure that this report came with some sort of meaningful change. And I'm hoping that UF, whether it's through you know campus units like SPOP or like whether it's through the administrators, that they continue to share this report but also make it more accessible. Like not everyone's gonna wanna read a 100 page report. Like, you know, even history majors, like we, sometimes we don't wanna read reports that long. Um, so I can only imagine, you know, people that aren't, you know, like I, I want this report to be available and accessible to not just college students, but like even, you know, K through 12, like people and kids. So I think like while I am very happy with what we did come out with. I'm continually trying to strive for, you know, UF to continue to do more with this. So there were a lot of people working on this kind of all together. I'm curious what parts are kind of like your footprint, like what more maybe specifically time period or topic-wise in the report were you focused on the most? Yeah, so my subgroup, we focused on the early history of UF um, and its connections to slavery, the Confederacy, and convict leasing. So we mostly focused on UF's history before 1905. So we looked into the two small public colleges um, that later merged to become you know, the University of Florida, and those two colleges were the East Florida Seminary. That was established in Ocala in 1853, and then the Florida Agricultural College, which was established in Lake City in 1884. And uh, fun fact about the Florida Agricultural College, it was the first to bear the name of the University of Florida when it was renamed in 1903. Um, and later on, those two colleges merged together and with the Buckman Act of 1905, um, that's how what we know today is as the University of Florida came to be. So 
Me, uh, Gabriella Paul, and Dr. John Sensbach, we focused on UF's early history before 1905, um, those two small colleges. I mostly focused on the Florida Agricultural College, and I looked into um, that college's ties mostly to the Confederacy. Uh, a lot of the early presidents came from plantation families, or they served in the Confederacy. I, like the Florida Agricultural College's dedication ceremony included the playing of Dixie and um, the cementing of Confederate bills into like a memento type of box. Um, so that was kind of, that college's ties to the Confederacy. There's also some ties to convict leasing there too, uh, mostly financial in the sense that uh, Henry Flagler, who, um, he was a railroader, and he made a lot of his wealth from convict leasing. And uh, he actually endowed a gymnasium at the Florida Agricultural College. It was called the Flagler's Gymnasium. So that kind of shows, you know, there are some financial connections to uh, convict leasing there. There's a lot still left to be researched. Like, we don't necessarily know if... Um, there were enslaved people who lived or worked at the East Florida Seminary. Um, and, and a lot of that is because there's a lack of records in that. Uh, the only surviving document of the East Florida Seminary, for example, is a 1861 commencement program. Um, so because of that, there's more research that needs to be done there. Uh, with convict leasing and like the Florida Agricultural College, there are some financial ledgers, um, but like slavery, when people write about things like convict leasing or enslaved labor, they don't really focus on the people doing that work. They mostly focus on the people benefiting from that work. Um, so there's not a lot of records that we've found so far in that. So I'd love to, for other people to pick this up and you know continue to do that work. Um, one thing with the report that like Dr. Ortiz and I always talk about is you know, we think of this report as kind of like a building block. Like it's not set in stone. It's not the like a end all be all product. We want this report to inspire other researchers, scholars to, you know, continue to like ask these questions and to further research what um, UF's connections to these different things are. Um, but yeah, that's where I'm at. Yeah. Uh, I have something down in my notes about specifically um, regarding for his, Florida's history of slavery and the 1842 Armed Settler Occupation Act. Uh, is that something that related much to your area of focus in the report? The, sorry, which one are we it talking was about? the 1842 Armed Settler Occupation Act. Yeah, Dr. Ortiz was talking about that. It's like... He mentioned it specifically after I originally wrote colonialism, and then he said it was the 1842 Armed Settler Occupation Act, where um, the land was uh, sold off in lots to uh, colonial, uh, you know, colonial settlers who were willing to take up arms to fight. Uh, indigenous rebellions or armed slave rebellions and you know the land was you know taken from you know unfair treaties from native lands so uh we would just record included that in there in case mm -hmm. you knew anything about it uh i, I just wanted to you know you cover all the bases like yeah i know i know very little of that act in that's particular fair. um that's fair I've, we have a, a portion of the report that deals with UF's connections to uh, Native Americans and um, okay. land dispossession there. So uh, I'm assuming that like that's where the that's most of the book is. Mostly, yeah. um, I do know a little bit about you know <laughs> UF's ties to indigenous expropriation and slavery, um, in the sense that the the seminary land fund that created the East Florida Seminary that came from the expropriation of uh, Seminole land following the Second Seminole War, um, and the Morrill Land Grants College Act of 1862 that basically provided funding for state universities from the sale of ceded or seized indigenous lands west of the Mississippi River. And that act in particular, it allocated to Florida scrip for approximately 90,000 acres from 900 
96 parcels of Indian land, and that was ceded or seized from 120 tribes across nine states. Well, you know so much about this. I, I like wrote this know. down, <laughs> <laughs> but like, we'll see you, you like mention the other act, and I was like, mm, I don't think I know that much there. Uh, but yeah, this is why like I wrote this down for, in my notes, because I just like, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm kind of curious more about like the process of creating it, maybe like, what was it like to work on a project like this, to work alongside professors? Did you, you know, do research in Ocala or in Lake City? Um, you know, did anything get cut that you didn't want to get cut? I mean, it took two years to yeah. write. That's, that is a long time. Did it go through changes over that course of time? Yes. <laughs> um, I want to say, like, I think the last at least six months of us having a report was mostly us like editing, proofreading, and just making sure that like all the footnotes matched and everything was uniform. Um, but a good portion of that process was us really, you know, splitting up into groups and then researching the different areas. Um, my subgroup that was doing UF's um, early history we focus mostly on the two predecessor institutions that were in Ocala and Lake City, and mine was the Florida Agricultural College. So I was able to go to Lake City and dive into their archives and do some research there. Um, I also want to say, like, the reason why it took a long time for us to come out with the report is it was all volunteer based. So, like, none of us were necessarily getting paid for it. So like this is professors, grad students, like you know, just volunteering their, their time to do this report. Um, so th that's one of the reasons why I think it took a long time for us to to do this because it was hard, you know, getting together uh, every now and then and just talking it through and then actually sitting down and writing this report um, because from my end, like I was in my first year of law school then and like still like trying to like find the time to you know sit down and like write my parts of it um, but that's kind of what the process was like but once we like started finding these little breadcrumbs like it it went by really fast um, but yeah and it was really cool to work with um, other professors and scholars on this task force Gabriella Paul who uh, was one of the authors of the 2019 History Undergraduate Report, and she uh, was one of the co-authors of the Student Government Resolution. She was also on this task force with me, so it was really nice to be able to um, to work with her on this. And then also just working with professors is really cool because like you always see them like in the front of the classroom and they're they're lecturing and doing their stuff, but then to be able to sit down with them and then you know be their colleague and research alongside them is just a really cool experience, so. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, um, one of the questions I have, um, by understanding the history of the past through the task force report, right, what does it tell us about our current climate, about our current times, by us now learning all this history, you know, legacy of exclusion for a lot of individuals, into uh, in the past, how does that how does that impact today's time? What are some of those significant connections that you made throughout the report in today's time that is still being impacted because of that past? Cool. It's a loaded question. <laughs> um, so our our history dates all the way back to 1853. So there's a, a lot of history behind there, um, and. There, there's just a lot going on at UF in terms of, you know, it was created as an all-white, all-male institution at first. And we still see traces of that today in the sense that, like, we're still predominantly white. Um, black student enrollment, like, has decreased significantly. Um, actually wrote this down because I was like, I need to make sure I say this. <laughs> yeah. So in the report, we talk about how black student enrollment and Native American student enrollment has decreased significantly. Um, black student enrollment constituted approximately 10% of UF's undergraduate population in 2009, but it accounted for less than 6% of UF's undergraduate population in 2020. 
Um, in addition to that, Native American student enrollment has declined since 2009, and students of Native American heritage have never comprised more than 0.6% of UF's undergraduate population. So I think in learning more about UF's history of indigenous expropriation and UF's history of slavery and racial injustice and all the legacies of slavery, it kind of shows why we see these decreases in student population. Um, and there's even been a study, I think it's the University of Virginia that's done this study, but there's a study on how engaging in racial justice work and researching history has an impact on student enrollment. Um, students want to be enrolled in an institution where they feel their values are, or where they feel that their history is valued. And I think, you know, if UF does more to make this report more accessible and to make UF more diverse and inclusive, then we can create that space and we can increase a sense of belonging for all marginalized students. And that could very well lead to an increase in black student enrollment and an increase in Native American student enrollment too. Um, so I think reading the report and learning more about UF's connections to, to slavery and indigenous removal, and then like seeing, okay, well, black student enrollment has decreased and Native American student enrollment has also decreased. You just see these little trends. And while we have progressed a lot since, you know, the, the 1800s, the 1900s, it kind of gives you a sense of the maxim that like the more things change, the more they stay the same. And that's why I think it's so important that, you know, while we have this report and we have this history and while things have been getting better, we need to continuously and actively engage into, okay, how do we make this university and in, a, like more inclusive institution? How do we make the table longer, not higher? That's a good line. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I think in terms of that answer leads really well into another question like in terms of the impact that's still here today. I mean, all the buildings on campus, and they're named after segregationists and reactionaries or whatever. And that was part of the push in 2020, was there's a task force on building renamings. And it, I mean, as far as I know, I don't know of anything that has really come out of that. So I guess, could you talk about that aspect of um, that moment in 2020 of renaming buildings and your opinions or just anything you know about that? Yeah, so I was not on that task force um, in particular. That was the task force on honorary namings. Um, they essentially met for as long as we did on the history task force. And not a lot of people know about this. I didn't even know about it until I was on UF's anti-racism website, which also not a lot of people know about, but we'll talk about that later. Um, <laughs> But they actually did come out with a report. Uh, I want to say that report is less than 15 pages, and there are no specific buildings named <laughs> in that report. Um, I'll definitely have to double check that, but I just remember <laughs> like comparing my history task force's like 100 page report to like this renaming or like honorary naming task force report and seeing like, okay, this one's like. 10 to 15 pages and has no explicit naming of any buildings. So all the buildings that students have been protesting, like the Rights Union, the O'Connell Center, none of those were even named in that report. Um, also, I feel like I'm low-key gaslighting myself, so I will need to double check to make sure. I believe you, though, that, 100%. Um, but yeah, actually, I can probably pull it up, if anything. But. Yeah, there's not a lot of people that know about that honorary namings task force report. And that's all I can say there. I, as, as nice it is to know that there are a lot of students pushing for, you know, renaming buildings um, and, as lot of, and as much momentum as that movement has gotten, I don't necessarily see that happening anytime in the near future with our current political climate, um, but yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
How do you think, what do you think the relevance of the report is today? And how do you think it's changed uh, in light of like how much Florida politics have changed since 2020? Um, you know, before we had a president that would have been willing to, you know, make this report uh, and call for it. But now it's kind of, it kind of seems like with everything going on, we're not allowed to uh, make it a, make it make a sh show it to the student body is the way they would have before so i don't know if that's i, I know that's difficult yeah. to speak on but you don't have to speak on it but sorry give me a, a hot second i want to know about the, this yeah so okay so the task force on our honorary namings i'm gonna go back okay. for a little that's bit okay. <laughs> they had a two-year tenure they published an 11-page report that noted that a naming may be removed with approvals of the president and the board of trustees chair, then where continued use of the name would be damaging to the reputation of the university. The report makes no mention of the Rights Union, the O'Connell Center, Smathers Library, or Buckman Hall, which were the very building students protested that led to the creation of the honorary naming task force in the first place. Um, I wrote a paper on that, so that's why I was like, I need to yeah. pull that up to make sure um, that I'm saying that right. But with that being said, the reason why I don't necessarily think that UF will rename any buildings in their future is because based on what was in that report, it says like a rename or a building may be renamed if it's harmful to the reputation of the university. Well, what does harmful to the reputation of the university mean? From our point of view, we're like, um, yeah, these buildings were named after people that have done some pretty, you know, bad things, like they should be renamed. But from a administrator's point of view, or from people that don't necessarily know that much about this history, they are under the impression that reputation means money, and reputation means rankings. And so long as a university's existing, or a building's existing name doesn't affect our ranking, and so long as it doesn't affect our funding, then it's fine. So that's one of the reasons why I feel like, you know, we should still be pushing for you have to rename buildings, but it definitely is going to continue to be an uphill battle. And our current com political climate just makes it even more difficult. Um, and Gabrielle, going back to your question, this task force report is very, very hard to talk about, or it's, we have to be very cautious in talking about it in our current political climate. Because as we know, there is a current attack on diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. And we're just like, OK, well, what does diversity, equity, and inclusion mean? Um, so there are a lot of professors in history and in political science, and even professors at the law school that are wondering, OK, well, how do I teach classes about like the history of race, for example, with a bill like this coming out, and that's supposed to come into effect July 1st of this year. Um, so a lot of the dissemination of this report came mostly from student organizations. It came from task force members who have shared it with their respective networks. It's come from professors tweeting about it, um, and uh, a lot of posting on social media, like groups like SPOP or um, student governments, students taking action against racism, which was STAR. Um, but the task force report has not had any official publication or statement from the administrative level. And I think that's one thing that I was really disappointed by, that our publication of the report didn't come with an official statement. It didn't come with like um, an administrator like sharing it on UF's like bigger social media platform or anything like that. Um, it was just, it was merely posted on UF's anti-racism website. And I'll tell friends like about UF's anti-racism website and they'll be like, what, we have an anti-racism website? So like, yes, we did make the report accessible, but to what extent is that accessibility if most of the sharing isn't coming from the higher ups, you know? Um, so there's what I think on that end. And I think with our current political climate, which has just continuously gotten more and more strict, like we had the Stop Woke Act, 
in the fall, and that got struck down um, by a federal court, and now we have House Bill 999. It's just been continually harder to talk about this report or share this report because when people hear the words like racial justice or racial history, you know, they automatically think like, oh, mm. so <laughs> there, there's that. I remember when I was first doing my student government resolution, um, I was in contact with our first chief diversity officer about that resolution. And I had mentioned to him that our resolution had passed and he emailed me back and sent me a message saying, um, congratulations, you have navigated the three-headed dragon of fear, greed, and hunger for power, which um, swallows up coalitions of justice far too often. And I remember reading that and thinking, wow, he's... <laughs> well, I remember reading that and it kind of just affirmed what, what I was arguing in my thesis is that students are that driving force for change. And the more I thought about it is the reason why students have so much power on college campuses is because student activists are immune then like we're insulated from that three-headed dragon of fear, greed, and hunger for power. Like we're not worried about you know losing our jobs. We're not worried about retaliation. We're just there. Like we're getting a degree. We're being activists. But um, for other people who are staff and who are faculty, you know they're not necessarily as protected from that three-headed dragon. Um, and I've realized that fear is the most powerful head in that dragon. And with the Stop Woke Act and House Bill 999, you know, we continue to see fear being that driving force and being that monster um, because there are professors and there are faculty and staff that are now wondering, um, you know, what can I teach without jeopardizing my position? You know, what can I talk about um, that's going to comply with this, you know, with this bill. So I feel like with today's political climate, it shows that the task force report is even more important than ever. Um, and that we just need to continue to be vigilant and continue to be cautious and share this, this information. Sorry, I'm going off on a tangent. <laughs> Um, but, but yeah, one of my favorite quotes of all time, it comes from uh, Florida Governor Ruben Askew. And he said, a leader is someone who cares enough to tell the people not merely what they want to hear, but what they need to know. Um, and I feel like this task force report as a whole is a perfect example of that. Like our history of indigenous removal and slavery, convict leasing, and like segregation, that's not something we really wanna hear in the 21st century, but despite all that, it's something that we need to know. We need to know this because our student enrollment for minority groups is declining. You know, we need to know this because we, we, have, we as a institution could strive to make UF a more inclusive campus. Like, there's always something we could be doing better. Um, so, I think that's something that I really love about that uh, quote there. And just know that like, if UF wants to be a leading institution, then we need to be able to have these uncomfortable conversations um, despite the political climate that we are in. Did you, <clears throat> I guess uh, you sort of mentioned a little bit about like retaliation through like uh, Senate, state, uh, through bills uh, being presented. When you were working at the task force, was there any retaliation for any groups from as you were putting the report together, the group? Not to my knowledge, no. no. Um, we as a task force, we were very careful in the sense that we made sure that we that all the information we put out there, it was objective, it was fact-based. So there's not really anyone who could push back and say, no, like UF didn't have any connections to slavery. And we could say, well, these are the board of trustees and these are how many enslaved people that they owned. So we took a very objective approach when it came to the task force report. But no, there wasn't necessarily any pushback that I am aware of from that. 
Okay, this is a very special task force report that was put together at this university. Have you, do you know of other universities that are doing similar uh, work in uh, recovering that history, but you know, racial history, uh, social injustices history, just similar to the task force, or are we like the one doing this, the first peep folks working on this? Uh, we are uh, part of a larger, much larger movement. Um, so actually the entire movement of universities studying their uh, connections to slavery, it started in 2001. Um, and I believe it was at Brown University or Yale University. Um, but graduate students there just wanted to research their connections to slavery. So it, this whole movement started in 2001 and it has grown to approximately 100 institutions across six countries. And now um, that whole, the official movement and group for it is called U the University Studying Slavery Consortium, or USS. Um, so there are officially 98 member institutions that are signed onto it. And all the institutions of USS are committed to um, researching their connections to racial injustice. Um, and some notable institutions there include Harvard, Georgetown, the University of Virginia. UVA actually started that consortium in 2015. Um, and since 2015, it has grown to the 98 institutions that it is now. Um, so we are a leading institution, but not in this sense. Um, I will say that there has yet to be a Florida college or university to join the University Studying Slavery Consortium. Um, so it would be really nice if UF did that, and then we could be the first in Florida. But um, yeah, there's a lot of other colleges and universities that are doing this. I have a whole slideshow on this, so I'm trying to like pull up any pertinent information. <laughs> Well, you mentioned UVA, and I understand that you and Dr. Sensbach uh, went up to UVA to present the report. Um, do you want to say anything about that, what that was like? Yeah, so Dr. Sensbach and I, um, we were able to go to the University of Virginia. Um, UF funded my travel to it, which I thought was like a really good sign to show like, oh, okay, like they're on board with this. Um, and uh, we got some funding from the president's office, the provost office, the office of the chief diversity officer. Um, SPOP also helped with sponsoring our funds as well. Um, the history department and the African American studies program. So we had a lot of these different campus units. So I was really surprised, but also like really happy that we had gotten support um, from the president and the provost's office in that sense. Um, so we were able to fly to Virginia and we did a breakout session at UVA. Uh, we talked about the entire process of how we got to the task force report. So we started with the 2019 history undergraduate report and then to my thesis, the student government resolution, and then the task force report. Um, and we kind of ended on a where do we go from here type of discussion. There are a lot of other institutions from other states really interested in our presentation because we had the Stop Woke Act in the air during that time. Um, so we were able to present all of our work and I remember at that time thinking like, okay, UF needs to do more, like we are very slow in this movement, but going to that conference and listening to other institutions, it made me realize we're not necessarily slow in this work. Like for example, Harvard, and I wanna say the University of Georgia took maybe two to three years to join the University Studying Slavery Consortium. So like us still, we're on about year three and still like iffy on it. It's not necessarily us being slow, it's us being an institution and jumping through the bureaucratic hoops of it all. Um, I also remember ranting in the breakout panel about how you know, we wanted to make sure that this task force wasn't, you know, like our task force report wasn't just gonna sit on a shelf and we wanted to ensure that UF would continue to take positive steps towards meaningful change. Um, and one of the, the people that came to our breakout panel was telling me like, 
you know, you should know that like your report is like very impressive. It's about 100 pages and you have a lot of information here. And you should know that there are institutions that are signed on as member institutions of USS, but they're not doing this kind of meaningful work. And she was like, you guys are kind of on the other side in the sense that you're doing the meaningful work. You're just not signed on. So that made me feel a lot better um, about where we are with all of this. But yeah, it was a really, really fun time to go to UVA and share UF's work, but like also learn from other institutions and how they have navigated this work. Um, one of the biggest things I learned at going to that conference was uh, when you invest in this kind of racial justice work and engage in it, you can have a increased alumni engagement. Like, and Wake Forest saw a 110% increase in black alumni donations and a 10% increase in black alumni per participation since joining USS and since engaging this kind of work. So it made me realize that you know, this work, it doesn't just stay within, you know, the history building. Like it really does have an impact on the larger university, um, higher academia community. Um, but yeah, some more stuff on USS that I forgot to mention is, as I said, they're a consortium of 98 institutions across six countries. It began at UVA in 2015. They're all focused on sharing the best practices and guiding principles about truth-telling projects, addressing human bondage and racism in institutional histories. And when researching USS and looking at their member institutions and also looking at the US News and World Reports, I learned that of the top 100 institutions, there are 22 that are members of USS. And of those 22, 14 of those institutions are either tied or ranked above UF. So it really goes to show that these are what leading colleges and universities are doing. And that's one of the reasons I'm trying to push UF to do this work is, you know, we should be at the forefront of this movement as well. We should be one of the leaders here. Um, but yeah, um, other colleges include uh, the University of Georgia, University of Mississippi, Harvard, Yale, Emory, all those great institutions. But yeah. Um, one question uh, I have. Okay, so it seems like there has been challenges in pushing this out to the public the way that it should because of UF. Who are these? Who are the main actors that are not that are not allowing this to happen? Is this like the board of trustees? Is this the president? Um, who is it? Or is it who do who do is it like pointing a finger at someone? Or is it just all the? I'm not sure. I'm not sure here. <laughs> I guess that's what I'm trying to figure out. Like who's the one in charge of all this that's not allowing for this to move forward? I would say there are, what I learned in being in this task force is um, when administrators retire, they become a lot more candid. <laughs> and there's a lot that administrators and professors want to do. Like they want to make these meaningful changes and you know they want to address this history, but they, have their hands tied in the sense that there's always fear kind of in the background. Um, they have to comply with things that the Board of Trustees want or what uh, the governor wants. Because UF is a top five public institution, the key word there is public. And because we're a public institution, there are certain rules that we have to follow. Um, so I want to say, that while I could point fingers at you know certain administrators that could like not really want this report to be shared, part of me wonders you know to what extent do they genuinely not want this to be shared, or to what extent is it mostly fear that's kind of lurking in the background? Um, more on the the board of trustees, if I can pull this up. <laughs> I'm sorry, I wish I had all this more prepared. No, this is good, <laughs> hey, please. <laughs> um, you don't have to have a book report for us. <laughs> you already wrote the report. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's a, there's just a lot of challenges here. Like, um, and you know, those are things that we question. Like, we do want to share with the people out there this report for sure. Um, but you know, we even talked about it with Dr. Teeth, um, even providing this information to incoming uh, first year students mm -hmm. to know to understand where they're the history of UF and see even they themselves could create some type of change during their four-year experience. Yeah. Uh, but like I mentioned, this is not happening. It hasn't happened yet. And that's where I'm trying to figure out, like, who's, is it someone at fault? Is it just that it's not doable because of, like you mentioned, the public uh, side of it? And now, especially with the political climate in place, mm -hmm. like, what does this even mean? Like, it, it's, I guess my question at this point would be, because of the Vote Act and because of diversity and inclusion, all these issues that are being tied down at the state level, how will this impact the task force report? Is there like, have you heard any conversations about even maybe pulling it out of the website because of all this that's happening right now in our political climate? Is that something that you thought about or? I actually have never even thought about that. Um... I hope it stays on the anti-racism website. I hope we keep an anti-racism website, right. but then it makes me wonder, is even having the words anti-racism right. with like UF, is that okay to say nowadays? You know, like we don't really know much of how House Bill 999 is gonna affect us. Right. Um, hoping it gets striked down. I know the ACLU of Florida is already like on it and they're like opposed to it, um, but I think there's just a lot of, like I said, there's a lot of fear of, you know, what's going to happen in the future. Um, so it's been increasingly harder to share this report with that current political climate. But at the same time, like, we just had, you know, President Fox leave and we have um, a new president right now who is still, you know, trying to get a feel of the university, still trying to make his cabinet. And from my understanding, he hasn't really met with any student organizations yet. Mm -hmm. um, so I can tell by like the, the climate of it all and all these changing parts right now that this task force report isn't necessarily in the forefront of people's minds. Like there's a lot in the air. So I don't even remember what your question was. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, I think you asked the question. Um, one thing that I want to ask you, uh, based off the report, what is one of the things that you wish everyone in UF community know, knew about the report? If you, if you could choose a section or a portion, what would you say, this is what I want y'all to know? I literally sat with this question for like half an hour last night and I was like I do not know how to answer this because um, I'm indecisive and I can't really think of like you know just a what is one thing we can get from this report um, I think there's a few takeaways one of that is our institution was founded in 1853 so there's a lot of history there um, and we need to be able to take all of that history in, the good, the bad, the ugly, the highs, the lows, the in-between. So there was a lot that is behind our status as a top five public institution. And whether we like it or not, you know, we have, our institution has connections to slavery. It has connections to convict leasing, prison labor, indigenous removal. Um, and that's something that we very much need to acknowledge um, but we also need to, to remember that this isn't something that's like uncommon among institutions. Like any institution for the most part, if it was founded before the 13th Amendment, it most likely has ties to slavery. Um, so that's one thing, like there's a lot of history behind our 1853 founding date. Um, and then I think another thing is like not all of this is in the past. Um, our report does talk about the declining black student enrollment and Native American student enrollment. So while this is the history of, you know, slavery, like it continues to affect us today and how we confront this history, it is a marker of our commitment as an institution to social justice. And it's a marker of, you know, what are we willing to do to increase diversity and inclusivity on this campus. Um, 
And then I think one last final thing about it is it shows the power of student activism. So the task force report came from the student activists that were pushing for the student government resolution. And it also talks about Black Thursday, for example, um, and how student activists, April 15th, 1971, how they were able to conduct a sit-in, which eventually led to the IBC. And after the IBC, it came La Casita and the Multicultural and Diversity Affairs Center. So um, it really does show the power of student activism. And I remember when reading more on the report, um, I was reminded of an interview I had done with as an intern for SPOP, and it was with Akil Reynolds, who was, I think he was the vice president of the Black Student Union. And I did my interview with him in 2018, because I was doing a project on Black Thursday and the IBC. And he mentioned how the progression of one community leads to the progression of all marginalized communities. Um, so it really just shows that, you know, if we confront this history, like it comes at the benefit of all of us as an institution. Uh, it makes the table longer, not higher, so. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about the, the role of student activism in this and also personally having been involved in like student activism causes in my time at UF, you see kind of the strengths and what student activism has accomplished, but I feel like the the failings and kind of inherent limitations of student activism are also kind of apparent. And that occurs to me to think of like this big push that happened in 2020 to make this happen. Um, and then two years later, the report is finished and most of the people who made that push are graduated yeah. and gone away. So there's not the people there to be like, hey, this isn't, you know, this isn't the reception that we wanted for this. So I, I guess what What's your thinking on that? Like these, the fact that a student cause has this half-life of at most four years before it kind of, because I've seen that like disintegrate <laughs> yeah. enough times. So I, or what could students do different maybe to try and create a more lasting thing beyond their four years? You asking this question makes me so sad um, because I have a year <laughs> left and I will I joke about this to a lot of people. I tell them, you know, I might just get a PhD, so UF can't get rid of me, <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> I'd graduate by the time I'm 32, but like that gives me another seven years of, yeah. as like a student activist. Um, because I have seen this in my time as an undergrad and my time as a grad student. Like for example, we had Divest UF, yeah. which was really pushing for UF to cut contracts with the FDOC, um, but then all of them graduated, and then we had CAPS that kind of took their place, and that was the coalition to abolish prison slavery. So like you see these different groups kind of, not necessarily like reinventing the wheel, but like, yes, they, they are essentially doing that same type of work. And it made me realize, or it made me wonder like, okay, well what can we do to ensure that we're not, we're no longer reinventing the wheel here? Um, so, with this report, like I'm sure there's a whole history of, they make a task force report. It sits on a shelf. People forget about it. Okay, let's make another task force report on like the same thing. It sits on a shelf. We kind of wanted to ensure that, you know, this was so accessible and so shareable to where there's no one that feels like they're gonna reinvent the wheel. And there's no one that's going to have to do all this research on their own because it's already here. Um, I think with student activists in particular, just having your activism grounded in a specific university entity or with professors, especially those that are like tenured, um, it can help sustain your work. So for example, like I've been pushing for UF to join the University Studying Slavery Consortium since 2020. Um, it's 2023 and we're still not there yet. But I know that, you know, even if I do graduate in a year, that the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program will continue to take that and continue to push for it. Um, so I just think like having your activism grounded in a particular entity and even like inspiring the next generation of student activists um, 
to continue on and to like pass on the torch to, I think that's so important to ensure that the activism doesn't die down and that the momentum continues um, despite people leaving. And you know, administrators, they know this. They know that like, yeah, like they know all the activists are out here, but they also know like they're gonna graduate in like three to four years. So um, just being very strategic in networking, I think is very important. Um, there was something I did want to mention with the Board of Trustees, if you don't mind if I go back to that. So I had a friend, Asia Gilbert, she was actually on the Honorary Naming Task Force. Do you know her? She came on MFP. Yeah, oh. we had a conversation. <laughs> oh, she, she's great. Yeah. Um, but she actually wrote a article for The Alligator, uh, and it was titled Unraveling UF's Ultimate Decision Makers, the Board of Trustees and its Lack of Diversity. And in that article, she mentioned that of the Board of Trustees, um, she mentioned that UF's true decision makers are the Board of Trustees. And that board has 13 members, and only two of those members are elected, while six are appointed by the governor and five are chosen by the Board of Governors. Um, she noted that the board exhibits cultural, racial, occupational, gender, and political, um, oh, I can never say this word, homogeneity, homogeneity. Um, and she highlighted that 11 of the 13 trustees are white, 11 of the 13 are male, with two people of color being men and two women being white. And all but two of the trustees have made donations to conservative funds. Um, and in reading that article, you realize that the Board of Trustees really is the true decision maker. So while there are people in administrator, people in administration that want to make meaningful change, like they're ultimately like they have to abide and comply with what the Board of Trustees want. And from that article alone, like you can tell that our Board of Trustees has a certain political leaning. They have, you know, a certain makeup. Um, so I think there's a lot that can be said there. And what I would love to see is that, you know, we always talk about diversity and inclusion and promoting diversity among faculty and staff and students. But what about the people that are in power? Like, we need to promote diversity and inclusivity on all levels. Um, when I went to, to UNC for a conference for USS, one of the people speaking mentioned that, you know, students are always at the center for change, but they're never at the center of power. And I, I think that's so important. And if I had to go back and do the task force all over again, one thing I would like to have like seen is more students on that task force. Um, because other than me and Gabby, there's probably one other graduate student there, but like Gabby and I were really the only students on that task force. And from you know what I wrote about in my thesis and from what I learned from other institutions, students truly are that driving force for change. And like they they're so energetic, they're so hungry. And Dr. David Canton will tell you like, you know, ages 18 to 24, like you're your most energetic. That's why you should like go out and vote, you know. That's where the activism hits. So I I think just having more diversity and inclusivity in that sense would have been really cool to have. Um, because, you know, professors like they are very passionate about this work, but at the same time they have you know, their own classes that they have to teach. They're doing their own research, writing their own books. Whereas like students, you know, we're, we're kind of here to, to make things, to shake things up, you know? We're here with the activism. So that's one thing I would have loved to see more on the task force if I had to do it all over again. Um, but yeah, just, I, I would love to see more diversity and inclusion on all levels because we really do talk about we need more and more diverse staff and students and faculty, but then it's like, well, what about a more diverse board of trustees? You know, um, and yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit scary speaking about that because right now, you know, where we can't even focus on diversity and inclusion, that's being under attack. And with the board still in power, 
I feel like we're in that in that scenario where it's going to be harder to change the board. But uh, ultimately, the power, somewhat of the power, could rely on the students, like you mentioned. So it's going to be interesting to even follow up with that uh, down the road, see what happens, or if there's a way that that power could be shift by adding more diversity and within the board. Uh, to conclude this interview, I know we've been here almost over an hour. Um, I wanted to see your thoughts or maybe a message, a message for the next upcoming generation that are coming to UF. What is that message that you would like to convey to them? I think for like the next generation, it's to not be afraid to speak out. Um, like I said, like my favorite quote is, a leader is someone who cares enough to tell the people not merely what they want to hear, but what they need to know. Um, while this history is uncomfortable, like it's something that you know we need to constantly speak out about and we need to constantly um, tell people about because it is important. Like how are we supposed to know if we're getting better if we don't even know where to start? Um, Dr. Patricia Hilliard Nunn, uh, she always had taught, you know, Sankofa, which means go back and get it. And she had mentioned that, you know, history is so powerful that like you really don't know if we're progressing as a community unless you really look back into our history. Um, and I think that's very important. And just know that you have more power as a student than you think. Like I never thought I would be on the task force. I never thought I would write this report or that our student government resolution would pass. I was just out there writing a thesis. Um, but it really goes to show that like, when you do have something that you're passionate about, just run with it and go for it. And nothing ventured, nothing gained. Um, so I, I would really like to echo that you know, as a student, you have a lot of power, like you're protected from that dragon of fear, greed and hunger for power. So make the most of your time um, at UF and yeah, make it better for the next generation in that sense. All right, Adrian, uh, any other questions? Excellent. Well, I want to give you thanks. Thank you for taking your time to uh, spend with us. We've learned a lot. I know I've learned a lot from you just now so much. Thank you for sharing all the information. And yeah, yeah. look forward to it. Of course. So much. Thank you. Thank you.